we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, welcome to CAMS uh, November 1st Friday event. My name is Jose Garza and I'm the museum educator. Today's program will feature the current exhibition Western Benham uh, by exhibiting artist Yao Shen Kuo. It was organized by our Team Museum Studies program, which is on view through um, Sunday, February 21st. Uh, for this program, um, we're going to begin with an introduction to the Team Museum Studies program, which is an opportunity for local teens and also an, oppor an exhibiting opportunity for local artists. Then I'm going to turn it over to Yao Shen uh, to discuss his, his creative process, and then we'll follow up with an, a QA session uh, immediately after. So if you have questions for Yao Shen, uh, please submit them, submit them using the chat function at any time. CAMS Education Galleries are located on the second floor mezzanine and feature artworks by participants in our signature learning and engagement programs. These programs include the LEAP Middle School Initiative, New Art in the Neighborhood, Art Reach, and Team Museum Studies. Team Museum Studies, which takes place over the summer, offers a select group of teens the opportunity to learn about museum careers and gain practical job skill. Participants learn from the CAMS, CAMS staff in all departments from curatorial, public relations, marketing, development, and more. And they work collaboratively to curate and organize an exhibition from start to finish in CAMS Education Gallery. The exhibition features the work of a local artist selected by the students, which premieres, which premieres during an opening uh, during our fall exhibition season. So 12 area teens are selected through an application and interview process. And we are very lucky to attract very bright and talented area teens. But at the same time, I have to admit, it's make, it makes it incredibly difficult to narrow it down to 12. This year's cohort included Candace Betts, uh, who attends Metro High School, Deja Brewer-Moore from Gateway Science Academy, Kate and Cade, Metro High School, Sarah Cal from John Burroughs School, Saskia Detman, who is homeschooled, Samaya Elmore, homeschooled, Christian Evans, Marquette High School, Isabel Izzy Jackson Cameron from Metro High School, Paris Kinsley from Belleville East High School, Layla Smith, who attends Grand Center Arts Academy, Catherine Welch from Hazelwood West High School, and Kelly Woodyard from Webster Groves High School. Um, due to COVID-19, Team Museum Studies was conducted as a distance learning program this past summer. We met virtually three times a week for four weeks, and each session lasting approximately three to four hours. It was intense, as is organizing a museum exhibition and learning how a museum works from top to bottom in four weeks can be, but by identifying shared values, working collaboratively, and leaning into the skills and talents that teens already possess, we were able to do it. I would like to take a moment and give thanks to the folks that helped us along the way. I wanna thank, uh, on behalf of the Team Museum Studies Program, all the museum staff that met, met with us and gave us insight into all the hard work they do and shared how they got here. I also wanna thank Yao Shen Kuo for his incredible work and generosity for sharing his compelling process with us. It was definitely a highlight of the program. But also a special thank you to all the artists who submitted proposals as well. Under any other circumstances, it's difficult to get 12 people to agree on anything, but especially when you are selecting among over 12 incredible proposals from local artists. It was an arduous process that took hours, but it was also the most fun rewarding and memorable. I think the difficulty in selecting an artist was also a testament to the caliber of artists we have working in our region. And the T uh, Museum Studies exhibition is not only a great opportunity to showcase your artwork or the artwork of local artists in our museum, but also to share their brilliance and experience with aspiring artists and artist professionals. I also think that Team Museum Studies is more than learning about marketable skills, jobs, and or employment, all important, of course, but it is also designed to be, uh, to make space for connection, for reflection, and for the imagination. It helps us to challenge our expectations, to grow, to gain confidence, but also to be aware that we have a voice and resources and the responsibility that comes with serving our prospective communities. It is a big task and the teens accomplished it with poise and grace. I wanna thank them for taking me along in this journey. I learned so much from you during our time together 
and I'm eternally grateful, especially during such uncertain times in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you again. So if you're a teen or an artist and have interest in this program, you can find information on our website under the programs tab. And then once you're there, you can look for the teen section where you can find the Teen Museum Studies site and the application and proposal submission requirements are there. The information for the upcoming year will be updated in the next few months. And then you can also reach me via email at jgarza at camsoul.org uh, if you have any further questions. Lastly, I wanna plug uh, this limited edition pen that the team designed for the program. I don't know if you can see it very well, uh, but this was created for the exhibition. Uh, and the image was taken from um, Yao Shinkuo's painting uh, titled Plating a Crown of Thorns that's included in the exhibition, Western Venom. Uh, proceeds uh, from sales help to fund the CAM, uh, CAM teen programs. And then you can find this pen exclusively in our shop while supplies last. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Yaoshen. And while I'm doing so, I am going to uh, play a video um, of his exhibition in the background, in case you haven't had a chance to uh, visit his exhibition, which is rather incredible. So just give me a moment to share my screen. So Yao Shinkuo was educated in both the US and in Taiwan and completed his MFA from Fanfan University in 2014. Kuo is an active exhibiting artist and a co-owner of the artist run space, Monaco. He recently exhibited with Super Duchess, New York, Level 3, Chicago, Projects Plus, and Counter Public with the Luminary St. Louis. Uh, also terrain exhibitions in Oak Park, Illinois, in Granite City Art and Design District in Granite City, Illinois. Kuo has been an artist in residence with Paul Art Space in St. Louis and a recent recipient of a Regional Arts Commission support grant and a critical mass for the, for the Visual Arts Award. His work has appeared in publications that include New American Paintings and the Scene Journal Chicago. He has been interviewed by Yale University Radio and Cool Whip Podcasts and Kuo currently holds teaching appointments in St. Louis Community College Merrimack Campus, Washington University's University College, and Merrillville University in St. Louis. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Yaoshin. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining in on our first Friday with Cam and your interest in the exhibition, Western Venom in my practice. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen with you guys and we'll have a question answer section after I show you guys some information. There's a few short video clips involved as well. So just prepare for that. Make sure your audio is on and working well. So a lot of my practice is this based around the notion of sort of my own experience um, as an Asian American or also this term of being Oriental. Um, I know there's some debate on whether or not Oriental is an appropriate term to use. Um, I know in 2016, they kind of <laughs> took that out of a lot of school systems and public infrastructure. However, for me personally, it's not something that offends me, but I definitely would not go up to an Asian person and say Oriental to them. It's entirely an individual preference experience. And so a lot of the practice itself is based around this idea of being forever foreign um, and how that's been essentially part of our entire history in the United States and our relationship to European and American culture. And with that, I wanted to share a couple of, you know, sketches that I do as far as my process is concerned. One thing that I like to do is create a lot of images on my phone through various apps. For me, it's just very fun and very accessible and a quick way for me to jot down information and sort of see what's festering in my thoughts and let that come into visual existence. This is one of the sketches. It's an image 
from the film 16 Candles, specifically of the character Long Duck Dong. Um, if you haven't seen the film, it's, a, in my opinion, a classic American movie. Um, and this is combined and overlapped with an image from the video game Duck Hunt. One thing that stands out is that they both came out the same year, 1984. And in the game Duck Hunt, if you're not familiar, essentially the game is you point a plastic Nintendo gun at your screen and ducks sort of fly into your visual and you have to shoot it with the gun, you're duck hunting. In the last level, however, the designers of the game created a scenario in which you can't win. Uh, there's just like thousands of ducks appearing onto the screen. It's impossible to shoot them all. And whenever you fail to shoot the ducks, this dog appears out of the bushes. It's like a bulldog. And it sort of points and grimaces and laughs at you. It's sort of Nintendo laughing sound effects, sort of, you know, <laughs> laughing at your failures. And that always kind of reminded me of the feeling I had um, being an Asian American in this country. It was just like, man, even when I get to the final boss, the, the whole world is just set up for me to fail. It's like um, dangling a carrot in front of my face um, as far as like notions of assimilation and acceptance. So like many Asian Americans um, that grew up in this country, first and second generations, from those that I spoke to and heard testimonies about, we share a common experience of thinking that, you know, we just wish we were white. If we were white, then we wouldn't have to emotionally sort of struggle with all these thoughts and have to deal with it so much so to the point where you know there is kind of this notion of the model minority myth that is associated specifically with asian americans but i want to play a quick clip from 16 candles because it's quite relevant to my practice <laughs> happening, hot stuff. Very clever dinner. Appetizing food fitting neatly into interesting uh, round pie. It's a quiche. How do you spell? Well, you don't spell it, son. You eat it. <laughs> <laughs> So I really love that scene, um, especially when it sort of shows the family staring at him in this sort of foreign way. And the camera pans it's out. It's a quiche. Fit neatly Let into an interesting uh, round pie. It's a this one. This one here really reminds me of Norman Rockwell's Thanksgiving Saturday evening post image where that family sort of gathered around the turkey. And this is definitely 100% my feeling of basically being in any non-minority household in America growing up. And then that crazy laugh that that father has where he's like, you eat it, ah, ha, ha, ha. and it's like real sinister. Um, that's, that's so accurate in terms of how it sort of feels to be in that scenario in which like anything you say or do um, is almost like this so, so foreign and almost laughable. And so it's not so much like um, a type of trauma that exists with, you know, feeling like the same way that I think a lot of people feel where it's, it's just kind of like invisible. It's really hard to sort of see and tack it on because no one is being malicious towards you physically or even verbally necessarily. They're just sort of laughing at the pie, but it can feel very offensive. Um, like something is taken from you or you don't have a sense of agency. And so one of my favorite books on the subject itself, this is a quote from the book that I just feel resonates with me so deeply. I wondered if whiteness were contagious. If it were, then surely I'd caught it. I imagine this condition affected the way I walked, talked, dressed, danced, and at its most advanced stage, the way I looked at the world and at other people. This 100% um, captured pretty much my entire life living between the United States and Taiwan, uh, more specifically in the United States. But I have to also mention that 
you know, as an Asian American, I was also treated as a foreigner in Taiwan and still am when I visit um, any part of Taiwan or China as an adult. So I start to think about things that resonate with me. Um, I had a mentor in graduate school who said, you're always an artist, even when you're outside of the studio, inside or outside of the studio. And that's something that really stuck with me. It seems so obvious, but you know, it's a lot of times, you know, for me, people have to sort of just say these things and make them real for me to fully grasp the things that I'm already thinking about in my own mind. And so in that spirit, I feel that just seeing visual cues in around social media or in media in general and hearing the voices of other people, um, it's really this experience that has given me the strength for this exhibition and the works that I'm making right now. Um, you know, without some of these artists and these figures and these sort of cultural um, images that really tackle the notion of what I feel like I struggle with as an individual allows me and gives me sort of the confidence to move forward and say that, okay, if this person is able to do this, um, their, their courage gives me a tremendous amount of strength. Um, the fact that they're sort of talking about these things as most, I think people who feel live outside of any kind of normal through line, um, you know, when you bring these things up with friends or family or in your community, uh, it's often the case that you feel like you are, you know, crazy and that you're talking nonsense. It, it's just so impossible to share a lot of the things um, vocally that I experience and that, you know, my peers experience and other people that I identify with in my community. You know, we talk about this all the time about how you know, people just don't want to accept it or they don't want to hear you out. And therefore it kind of makes you feel like everything you're saying is this dramatic hyperbole and, you know, it doesn't exist. It's in your own head. So when I see artists like this and cultural figures and images like these, it really gives me the power to say that, you know, I'm not crazy and that I do know what I'm talking about um, and that people need to hear these things. And with the support of peers, um, students and colleagues and friends, uh, this is everything that sort of gives me the power to make this work, you know, and gives me the fuel in the studio. And as I sort of reflect on this sense of what I see shaping who I am and how I sort of work as a visual artist, the images that are appearing on screen are some of just random examples from culture and entertainment that I grew up really idolizing and it deeply attracted to. And, you know, you're kind of, when you grow up and you're kind of like staying up late to watch like Martin are uh, in living color or something like that, or Ren and Stimpy. It's, it's kind of made to feel like you're sort of wasting time, like this association of like TV watching or entertainment is a waste of time. This is, I didn't grow up obviously when I was young with the internet, so it was mostly cable TV that educated me about the world around me. And at the same time, I think the reason why this is so important and has really shaped who I am and how I sort of interact with the world is because these, creators of this content have shown, in my opinion, like very creative ways to sort of deal um, with the challenges and struggles that we face um, in all different sorts of genres. You can basically insert meaning into anything if you're looking for it. And there's one specific clip that I have here that really changed the game for me, which is the center image from a Nickelodeon cartoon called Hey Arnold. I will play for you the clip really quick and then share some thoughts on that. This is Mr. Wynn's first time singing here, but I bet you a bundle it won't be his last. Let's all give him a warm, great old Opry welcome, Mr. Wynn. <laughs> Before I begin, I have something to say. It is an honor to be here. So 10% of 5,200. I love country music. 
I love writing songs, but I am a simple man. I have a job in a restaurant and I like it. In fact, someday I hope to be a great chef. I don't want to be famous. Oh, Gerald. Not now, man. I'm trying to figure out how much money we're going to make. This is my first time singing at the Opry. Gerald, what? It will also be my last time. So now I will sing my song on stage for the last time. You can offer me a diamond-plated pearl. You can send me all the riches in the world. You can tempt me with the palaces of kings. I'd give them back in a big old sack and keep simple things. I've got simple things. I've got rain and spring. Got spicy chicken wings and French fried onion rings. So that's Mr. Wynn singing his country music hit song from Hey Arnold. And again, the reason why that really stuck out to me was because never in a million years would I've imagine someone with an Asian face having that voice come out of that biology. And that totally blew my mind that, you know, in this world of cartoons um, and creativity and visual information that that could exist. So when I see that it sometimes um, still makes me quite emotional from the initial experience that I saw Mr. Wynn um, and then hearing that voice come out because, you know, country music, for me growing up was kind of not for me. It was never, and it felt like it was never intended uh, for someone who looked like me, again, with my sort of biology. And the fact that all these cartoons and examples like Mr. Wynn singing here, um, it makes me think of something that James Baldwin wrote, which quoting him, it's, it's important that I'm able to articulate my voice in a way that white audiences are able to hear. So I really kind of resonate with that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do in my paintings as well, um, is sort of talk about these things, but not so overtly or directly um, in a sense that I'm actually able to communicate to the people that I think um, need to hear it and have a tendency to not have the capacity um, because of culture to absorb that information or see that information up front. And so taking this into sort of the fine art experience, you know, I feel like one of the most important painters for me is Robert Colescott. Um, with an image like this specifically, I'm extremely attracted to his work because he's sort of doing what I grew up watching doing it the same way, but you know, seeing his work in museums and seeing sort of the comical and the seriousness aspect in it, accompanying a historical element. These are all things that I completely admire about his work and hope to achieve in my own practice as well, especially because it's referencing images that we feel like are already famili familiar to us, whether we know them specifically or not which is very much sort of my experience of being um, just watching the world, whether it be through television or out in public or you know, on Twitter or something like that. And so we have that painting where he's imitating Washington crossing the Delaware uh, by a German painter, Emanuel Lutz, which is another aspect that kind of interests me in the fact that most of the representations and the ideas of we, that we have about America have been presented to us by immigrants. So this is a German painting interpreting this scene. And then we sort of collectively as Americans adopt and say, yeah, that's you know what we're gonna carry with us. And thinking about imagery as well, one thing that's really sort of led to the paintings that you see in Western Benham are these political cartoons, which I have these sort of scattered at my work desk at home in my studio um, these are pretty much everywhere I turn because these are images that I discovered in my research. I've never really seen these things before um, or, you know, went pretty deep into the history of these works, but they really resonate with me as well in terms of representations of the Asian American experience and what that looks like. And I'll show you guys a few examples of these just so you can sort of see what I'm looking at. 
And I like this sort of cartooning aspect that accompanies it. You know, in my mind, when I'm painting Asian figures, I'm always sort of thinking like, it's almost kind of hard for me to just determine like, okay, how do I make them like look Asian compared to just looking like a regular person? Um, what do I have to do so that people know that these people are Asian? Do I have to slant their eyes? Do I have to give them buck teeth, um, pointy ears or like rat-like features? You'll notice that a lot of times in these images, the Asian people are sort of painted with attributions of vermin which was very much the sentiment of the time period. You know, this is where the whole uh, kids in grade school coming up to me and be like, do you eat dogs at home? Uh, sort of, <laughs> that, that's where the idea sort of comes from is this uh, late 19th century leading up to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. And so here is just sort of like my response to absorbing some of these images. Um, here I, on the right is an image that I drew called the problem solved, where in my mind initially I was like, I'm gonna draw a Chinese Captain America. Um, what would that look like? And in a sense, he sort of, I was trying to make him look really foolish, but in a sense where the figure does not realize that they look foolish. Um, sort of rubbing against general American ideals such as like power being masculine and a masculine representation. I've decided to sort of pose him this way, but give him sort of Chinese operatic hand gestures. He's got the fan in his hand. Um, in, my, in my perspective, having knee pads that say USA on them um, was not a sign of strength, but a sign of weakness and sort of comedic weakness. And there's just a lot of sort of small details like that, that I was sort of thinking about his sort of uh, American flag scarf sort of waving in the wind in this sort of like um, damsel in distress appearance that I sort of took from spaghetti Western films. And so there's this notion that in the paintings too, you know, I've had people come up to me and say, why don't you paint paintings where you like really celebrate and promote the image of the Asian figure, uh, rather than sort of making them look like they're downtrodden or in a situation um, in which they're not being like elevated, you know? And my argument to that is really that <laughs> right now we don't, we don't have the capability to sort of visually empower Asian people in images because people don't even understand what we're struggling against. Uh, it just like would seem normal to them that we're being elevated in images um, due to things like model minority myths. So it's like, I almost kind of have to reveal the real truth, um, which is more of the suffering and the psychological experience or melancholia that comes with uh, racial oppression. These are some quick sketches that I sort of do when I'm watching Netflix, mostly just to make myself laugh um, but I think it is a valuable part of my practice, along with sort of creating collages as well, where I just sort of see what, how images that I'm familiar with when combined, uh, what they sort of do for me and what conversations those spark. And so here is another political uh, cartoon on the left. On the right is a Photoshop sketch for this painting. Uh, the image below it is the completed painting from 2019. And one thing that I didn't really notice until this year, um, relatively recently, to be honest, was how similar this bottom image on the right hand side is to the political cartoon on the left. There's just so many similar elements in the fact of, you know, the red uh, striping on the pants with the guy blue shirt. It's like that Uncle Sam figure becomes the flag overhead of my figure sitting there. There's sort of a rising sun in the background. The little ship on the sea in the background is replaced by a black and white running horse. Um, and at the same time, there's sort of uh, foliage or natural landscape on the foreground. There's the striped sort of bucket in the center of the composition where I have sort of the striped platform the figure sitting on and the house itself on the right. 
And I think this is, you know, why it's so important for me to kind of look back into history is because it's really educating me um, as someone who really loves painting and images in general, um, how to compose images, even if it's subconsciously. And then the image on the right above it, um, where I'm sort of pictured in, and then my face is inserted into George Washington. That's a part of my process as well, where when I hit a rough spot in the painting, I'm not really sure um, what to do. I just sort of play with it on my phone. And mostly, again, just try to make myself laugh because a lot of times it's like, why are things funny to me? If it's absurd to me, um, you know, what's <laughs> why is it so funny for me, for instance, to see a uh, Asian Ronald McDonald. I can never stop laughing at that picture of him. I don't know why it's funny to me. It's like, it just seems so absurd uh, where Ronald McDonald is such a ubiquitous American figure. But I can tell that they're Asian through clown makeup. Like, what's up with that? So again, this notion of subconscious similarities becomes quite important. And then some details I just kind of want to break down in the painting. Um, it gives you some insight into the other paintings in the exhibition as well, as far as details are concerned. For instance, um, I was thinking of this American house and what is, you know, the most common place that I would be able to find that information. And to me, thinking back to my childhood, it was watching Tom and Jerry. Um, and so I kind of put on Tom and Jerry in my studio and I would literally just put it on so I could screenshot how their artist uh, depicted uh, the American landscape and the American home. And then I saw this scene with um, Jerry, the mouse, you know, taking the pie from the windowsill as it's cooling, which is a theme that we've seen in like Leave it to Beaver and just very commonplace in American culture depicting American life. Um, so I thought that was really perfect um, for the painting as well for the scene that I was trying to set up here in the environment. And the central figure is sort of borrowed from this seen from Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight film uh, where Heath Ledger plays the Joker. And I'm not, I'm a, I like the film just as much as anyone else or, sort of who appreciates that genre of cinema, but um, I'm not like a crazy fanatic about it specifically. Um, but what I really do like about this character and um, the way Heath Ledger portrayed him is a lot of times when I watched the film, I felt like the clown makeup was a projection that we, the audience, or the rest of the world projects onto this character and that they don't, they're not actually wearing the makeup. It's just we who assign that makeup to them. And so I thought it was interesting to sort of put the clown makeup on my figure in a sense that like, yeah, this good try buddy, like this is a dream that is unattainable to you. So it's almost comical in the sense is what I was going for. And then of course we have this notion of the rising sun in the background. Um, America has always had this um, battle with this notion of um, Asia or the East sort of looming over, potentially taking over the superpower. They're always sort of watching, um, which is sort of why I inserted the Ronald McDonald um, face back there when I was sketching it. I didn't think it needed to go in the painting. I thought the sun itself was symbolic enough um, to represent that idea. Even if it's not really what you get out of it, that's obviously totally fine. And then I just wanted to show you that you'll often notice there are firearms in my paintings a lot, which go back to earlier works of mine where I was sort of painting large scale images um, and almost like a trompe l'oeil style of iconic American firearms. And so they sort of have made their way into these figurative pieces. And then I think about this notion again of the Washington, George Washington Carver sailing across the sea and this notion of America and its idea of itself being sort of represented by immigrants, um, specifically with Western films and Sergei Leone, who is one of the key figures of these spaghetti Western movies. But then we get this cowboy theme. So a lot of people will notice that uh, I use a lot of accoutrements and aesthetics from this Old West era. But it's, you know, not necessarily even a fascination with the Old West. I like Western films as much as I like other films. Um, it's more about what it represents and what America has sort of done with this character. 
of the Western time period. Simultaneously, you know, it's this is the time period when after the Civil War, when many Asian immigrants are coming into the country as well. Um, so for me, that becomes quite important. And then they basically set in laws in place and everything they could do to make the Asian person the exact opposite of these figures and the sentiments that accompany these figures culturally and socially um, that we see on the screen. And then this notion of uh, America's idea of the Oriental. We don't only see this you know, with Asian Americans or Oriental people. Um, but, you know, the, the fact uh, that this is still happening, um, there's countless examples of even films being made today that this is still an occurrence in Hollywood um, is actually quite important. So a lot of people might argue, for instance, that, oh, like, why pay attention to Hollywood? What's the big deal? Um, it, representation is a very big deal to a person's identity. And so, for instance, I think of Bruce Lee, who is such an important figure for Asian Americans and such a strong figure. I know it seems like, um, you know, so commonplace for, oh, an Asian person talking about Bruce Lee. But as I said, representation is very important. Um, and what he represented to us and to many Asian American people was this sense that we have power. Um, it was the opposite of all those political cartoons that were sort of made about us. Um, the experience as he sort of like sort of quoting him in an interview, the, you know, depiction of the Oriental with the Ching Chong bouncing around big Buckeye, uh, slanty eye, you know, Buckeye, buck teeth. Um, that sort of portrayal, he was the opposite of everything, which to see someone like on the screen like that and just be speaking in that way um, with our biology, um, for me, again, is this real sort of reconciling with the sort of cultural trauma that exists as an Asian American person. And looking at paintings as well, this is really what, sort of what inspired me to start to make the paintings in the exhibition that I've been doing for about a year, um, over a year, is artists like Horace Pippin, uh, where they're, again, this picture says so much to me. Uh, one thing that inspires me deeply in my practice is watching film and movies, because like I said, this sort of visual representation of reconciliation is monumental to um, articulating the emotions that I can't quite verbally say using language or even write down. Um, that's just not the way that I experience the world personally. My experience has always been through um, visual recognition. And Jacob Lawrence, of course, in a scene like this, like is so simple, but you, you can feel what the tension here, you can feel exactly what the conversation and the narrative is. Um, this for me is just exceedingly powerful and communicates to me very directly um, on a highly emotional level. And it also reminds me of some music videos. This is from a band I liked when I was young called Radiohead. And so we get into this notion too of like, um, showing images of like the flag and the snake, uh, you know, this is sort of the landscape that I think of when I think of a, um, a part of America. So when I'm in Asia and, you know, my peers are sort of asking me what it's like to be in America, it's this is the scene that kind of pops up in my head alongside um, what I would say other good things, um, this being the contrast to that. But this is really powerful because you know, this is the type of America that we are raised as minorities to avoid. Um, and I've just, like any person of color or minority has heard the horror stories of sort of driving through one of these places, um, being stopped, being harassed. Um, there are just extremely terrible stories that I won't go into from personal individuals that I've known in my life, um, close to my family from being sort of assaulted in these types of environments. So these are people that I fear. Um, I fear for my life 
when I see these this type of thing happening in front of my face. And that is something that, you know, um, is even hard for me to articulate right now. I'm getting a little bit emotional. And then seeing this as like a representation of a patriotic soldier, um, as you know, that is hard for me as someone who fears the previous images and to see this as patriotism, it's really kind of expelling me from the country, um, expelling every experience that I've had in America. So it's very hard for me to see this symbol and these symbols in general and have feel safe or feel like any kind of protection is being offered to me. And so I wanted to kind of take that culture in a sense of sort of confronting it face to face. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was sort of making these paintings that in my mind sort of were spawning from a lot of the sentiments and uh, visual cues associated with sort of rural America. And how can I sort of turn that into something that we can have a conversation about and actually share. So I really wanted to paint these sort of shotguns that are ubiquitous to um, people who go hunting uh, and say like, and paint them as beautifully as I possibly could in a sense of saying like, okay, maybe now we can have a conversation uh, about what's going on between us. Along with paintings like this, uh, How the West Was Won, this is the second version of it. The first version is quite similar. Um, but in my mind, I was selecting hats that I felt like were threatening to me and have this sort of notion of uh, colonizing one's culture or identity. So it's quite, in my mind, a very sinister painting if you look at it that way. And sort of getting, um, wrapping up at this moment, I wanna kind of talk about some of the decorative and aesthetic aspects that you see in the paintings. For instance, you see this highly decorated border, which a lot of the paintings in the exhibition do. This one is not in the exhibition, um, but it's a great example of sort of where this all comes from. And that decorative quality comes from the notion of toll painting, which is sort of like a craft painting technique. And most people who learn toll painting, learn it through a book, are sort of a hand-me-down scenario. So everyone kind of learns to paint flowers the same way, which I really sort of like this. It's the opposite of everything that I learned in art school. It is directly um, out of sight and out of mind in the conversation of Renaissance and its entire canon that comes after it and everything responding to art since that time and influenced by that time. I felt like it just really sort of lived uh, within the people, uh, our blue collar societies. And so here's some examples of toll painting, just to kind of show you. And for me, it reminded me of the decorative painting of Chinese porcelains as well. And of course the flowers and things have specific meanings, but you know, for us to sort of admire them and understand them and see how they fit in culturally and how they kind of describe uh, people and their experience, I think, um, you know, it's for us to interpret and just sort of understand it almost simply in that way. It doesn't have to be complex. So I'm using that border and at the same time, I'm drawing from a, a lot of elements like the memento mori or vanitas in the painting of the skull in many still lifes. And then the rattlesnake, which appears in a lot of works too. As I sort of briefly mentioned, um, the snake for me and from my experience of seeing images like the ones on the screen has sort of shown me that it symbolizes a couple things when I use it in the painting, the original 13 colonies, um, which is sort of like the system or colonization of this land. And so I'm sort of using it as a symbol of like, to put it delicately, the powers that be. And here's kind of just showing you how they have been displayed in other instances. Along with a work like this, which the great fear of the period, that title comes from an anti-Chinese political cartoon. And what I really love about the cartoons, which I didn't mention earlier, is a lot of the language in the text that accompanies 
uh, those images. The Great Fear of the Period had an image of a oriental man on there who looked very rat-like and was stealing jobs. But I like this notion of sort of switching it around um, and taking the rattlesnake. And there's a lot of sort of intentional things and the sculptural aspects of this. For instance, it's totally erect, um, which you would really not find a rattlesnake or any snake do that um, in nature. So it's unnatural in its pose. And at the same time, um, the installation as a whole with the shape of the astroturf and the way the painting is positioned, um, it's meant to be intrusive into any space that it's trying to be on display and sort of jutting out from the wall and blocking in the sense of sort of the um, man spreading notion, but I'm thinking about it in the sense of sort of uh, taking colonizing and man spreading across the continent. Um, and at the same time, the reason why it's also erect is kind of noting to this notion of uh, masculine power that accompanies that. And again, the astroturf is sort of set up to resemble uh, male genitalia with the entire uh, composition. And so here we see again representations where this is what you see a lot in the paintings is a figure, an Asian man um, doing something that looks like, you know, what I felt like Asian people wouldn't be really doing um, in America, but sort of encompassing that American experience, this sort of Ronald Reagan riding the horse cowboy sort of persona. But this one, they sort of are a hunter and they've caught this deer, but it's a small deer. So it's like every attempt that they attempt, uh, try to do to assimilate is a failed attempt, like it's never good enough. It's not like, it's the opposite of big buck hunter. And again, the pose is borrowed from this Marlboro tobacco ad. And so finally, we have an image like this one, which is not in the exhibition, but it was created around the same time. Um, this one is called Slipped in Hope. There's a couple things going on. We have sort of a female character in the cen center, and then we have uh, two male figures sort of center right. One of them wearing plaid, uh, buffalo plaid and jeans, and the other one not wearing anything. And in my mind, when I painted this, obviously it's really up to your interpretation was that the figures in plaid, including the female, have assimilated. They have become Americanized. Um, and they have abandoned their Chinese identity or their Asian identity rather. And so this sort of knocking out the naked Asian guy, it's the same person in my mind. And they're sort of eliminating a part of their identity away from them as they sort of acclimate into this new life. Um, but at the same time, the woman is a representation where she sort of gives us this uh, sadistic, um, view and sort of this uh, sense of invite, inviting voyeurism into the scene. And that's sort of what I feel like, like there's a temptation that you have to either choose sides or that, you know, maybe it's not the best thing that we assimilate into a culture um, because that really, you know, proves that we are not a melting pot in this country, even though it's advertised that way. And then these sort of like looming uh, pickle looking figures um, are again, sort of this subconscious thing of the sort of the powers that be or the temptation um, where they're sort of, you know, sinister and looming. And then there's these sort of Asian figures in camouflage scattered around in the dark matter. And they are pointing their guns. We don't know who they're aiming at. Um, are they shooting these sort of demons um, or what's going on, but I like that sort of uh, duality there where you're not really certain of who they're after and who their target is. Is it, in my mind, is it, is it my uh, Asian identity or is it my American identity? Because to be honest, for me, I, I still don't know who I identify with more or do I need to even make a choice? Why do I have to decide? Um, is a question that I ask myself every single day. And there's also some other qualities that just kind of go into this from images that I showed you. Guile and Fei Long, they're from a game Street Fighter. 
which is a game I played when I was young. I don't have too much time for games anymore. Um, but I really sort of like this. Fei Long was modeled after Bruce Lee. And Guile was sort of the blonde hair, blue eyed American soldier in the game. And that sort of reminded me of this sort of fighting scene, um, which eventually kind of came into Quentin Tarantino's, I think, 2019 film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where Brad Pitt sort of beats up Bruce Lee. And this was kind of controversial um, to some. For me personally, again, it's going to be a person to person case. I don't really mind it. I understand and accept sort of uh, the fantasy and the worlds that directors create in cinema. So it's okay for me. It just only, <laughs> if anything, it proves a lot of the things that I've been feeling um, that things are still not so hot for us and that there is still a lot of conversation and dialogue to be had um, through that scene, even though it might be comical to some. And then finally, this is the last image. This is Plating a Crown of Thorns, which is in the exhibition. I just wanted to say a couple quick things about this painting, because for me, um, this is the most personal painting as far as the narrative in this specific piece is alluding to. And there's this notion of the plating of the crown of thorns, which you have the thorns on the foreground, which they, in my mind, they could serve as sort of uh, rose thorn bushes which you know, is the symbol of the rose in general is this thing of beauty, but yet it's very dangerous um, and temporary at the same time as any flower is. But it also reminds me of the crown of thorns that Christ wore, which we find a lot in you know, the history of Western painting. Um, and this notion of sacrifice associated with the story of Jesus in those paintings and depictions of him sort of what that symbolizes. So that sort of ties into this narrative of uh, cultural sacrifice in this image. So this, essentially the way that I saw this painting was someone is in their home at night performing like a ritual, but this ritual is essentially just a ritual of them hunting and sort of proving that they're A, manly and B, American. Um, so much so that they have like this shower curtain that they keep up in their house um, that shows sort of the American dream, which ironically looks like a plantation home. Um, so this notion that this American dream, this person is sort of getting the wrong dream because of the way that it's things in histories and stories are sold and told to them. So they're trying their best to do the right thing, but they're being sort of dissuaded um, by the powers that be again. And so even with their attempts, they are sort of laughable and problematic at the same time, um, which is something that a lot of sort of non-English speaking immigrants run into is this sort of battle with um, American culture of sort of saying and doing the right thing uh, without being problematic, but it's really out of a state of innocence and confusion um, that's happening. So there's a lot of sort of elements in this image that also indicate this notion of disarray as well. All right, um, I hope I didn't go too long, but that's what I have for you guys. Yeah, Yashin, I think we have time for maybe a question or two. If anybody would like to ask something, you can um, submit it in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, maybe I can, uh, maybe uh, if I may, maybe I can ask you something. So um, yeah, thank you for your uh, artist talk and your presentation. Uh, talking about the content. Um, one of the things that um, during the TMS program that we realized, well, so we saw all these submissions on a computer screen because we were all meeting virtually. But on the last day, um, we were able to meet briefly in the museum in smaller groups. And we saw your artwork uh, in person. So like it looks very graphical and very graphic and flat. But when you actually like are in front of the paintings themselves, they're not, it's not the case. <laughs> There's a lot of texture there. And I noticed that uh, you use a lot of different materials in the painting. So when you look at the uh, the paintings, like the mediums that are included, there's like bone ash and marble, uh, glass sometimes. Can you kind of talk about um, why you include those materials in the paintings? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, I also really sort of what I, what I really love about looking at paintings um, from any point in time is actually just 
looking at the surface of them because that for me has always been very exciting, sort of that tactile quality you can't get from an image. Um, it's almost, you know, sometimes it like looks so good that I want to lick it, you know, um, at the, the museum or gallery that I'm looking at. So I kind of want to emulate that from previous painters throughout history, you know, like you don't really think about it when you look at like a Rembrandt painting or something about the texture or the surface necessarily. You just kind of think about it as an image. Um, but for me, it's almost like the surface kind of comes first before the image and determines it. And using things like bone ash and um, marble, I also like the notion of how it really kind of transforms not only the surface, but the, <laughs> this is really nerdy, but like the actual molecular structure of the substances on there. Um, being so rich and diverse with sort of minerals is just a very attractive feature to me when it comes to sort of making something. I, uh, we have a question in the chat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. It says, I'm curious if you're considered exploring your American Chinese identity in painting or sculpture as it relates to your experiences in Taiwan. Um, I am, I'm still trying to un understand that actually. So it's something I'm not able to mentally articulate is this notion of sort of who am I as a Taiwanese person? Um, because everything in my existence basically is like dualities because I'm also half Chinese technically and then half Taiwanese. Um, I'm half American and then half Asian. Um, you know, so I don't, I think about, again, I think about that every day. I don't know how I feel like some days I feel more associated and akin to my Taiwanese background. Um, but other days, not so much. Other days I feel very American. Um, I, the work will definitely go one direction or the other, but I am actually quite adamant about creating work that is able to talk specifically about being confused um, between the two, which I think is this Asian American experience. I have um, a few more questions, if it's okay. Uh, we have another question that came in. It says, diaspora seems to be heard and seen in the art world quite a bit lately. However, not too much about Asian diaspora. First, do you agree with this? And if you do, why do you think this is? I do agree with that. Um, you know, I, the, the reason why it is that I feel pretty confident in terms of why it's that way is in, that we're not really being represented at large, um, especially the, this specific conversation, is because of just the history um, itself where you know, so many things sort of play in where Asian Americans have been that sort of model minority. So it's like, just do the job and shut up. And if you're doing that, then, you know, you're good. We'll leave you alone, right? Um, and a lot of Asian people want to do that. Like growing up, just like, I would get really pissed off about something I witnessed or a way maybe someone has spoken to my mother, treating her like a foreigner. And, you know, the response from at least the first generation Asians are always, no, 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 don't say anything. Just, you don't wanna do anything, right? Just be quiet and they'll leave you alone. Um, and I think that really exists too, still just socially, because it's like in TV shows, it's always the Asian guy in the background smiling. Um, if they say anything, somehow it's worse if they were, voice their opinion than if anyone else kind of voice has an opinion or sort of stands out. Um, that definitely still exists 100% today. I, I mean, I feel it all the time, um, even in the professional world that I'm involved in. I know we're a little bit after five, but there's a question from Deja, who is in the Team Museum Studies program. Um, do you have time for one more question, maybe? Go for it. This is from Deja. Uh, it says, not to get too political or anything, but I do want to ask if the election has inspired you to create or sketch at all especially all of the media attention that is surrounding the election? The election right now has sort of put me aloof. Um, I'm very slow at processing information. Uh, I wish I was like cool and could actually, you know, um, gather a lot of quick information and turn it around and have a voice about it. Um, but if anything, it, I have a tendency for escapism 
um, during these times in terms of like reflection. So the work itself, not necessarily, I think if anything, it's just proven a lot of the narratives that exist in the paintings to be more true than I had thought before. Thanks, Yashin. I think, I know maybe some people have to go, but uh, there's another question. This is the last one, if that's okay, or uh, do you have time? Go for uh, it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for y'all that are uh, staying around for the uh, overtime. <laughs> it says, is the desire to subvert and dismantle the existing iconography of what it means to be American, or to become an accepted part of the land of that landscape? Is that the struggle? Let me read that again. I don't. Maybe I didn't read it correctly. Is the desire to subvert and dismantle the existing iconography of what it means to be American, or to become an accepted part of that landscape? Is that the struggle? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the way I interpret it is that personally, I'm not looking for anything necessarily to be dismantled if it doesn't have to be. Um, I think certainly points of views can be shifted and embraced, um, which would just naturally lead to a change in attitude or perspectives. So. I mean, I would go with that first over um, sort of a complete redo or take down and then rebuilding something. Um, because I think there's a lot of good things happening. I mean, it's so many positive things um, outside of the negative scope have emerged in the last decade um, regarding these issues specifically that I'm optimistic about. Uh, I think especially working from my professional experience working with uh, college age students Primarily young college students, you know, I see a lot of hope in their attitudes and their conversations um, to make change in the future. So thank you, Yashin. Uh, thanks for sticking around for over for the overtime and thanks to everybody else. Uh, unfortunately, that's where we're gonna leave it off. Uh, thanks for all the things to consider. Uh, also, thanks for being so generous with your time when you met with us during the team museum studies. Uh, I know we probably didn't get to spend as much time with you as we wanted to, but uh, I know the teens um, knew that they made a good choice, especially after they got to, to meet you and, and talk to you. So thanks again for your time and generosity. Thank you guys. Thank you to the CAM team program. Um, they really did so much for the exhibition. So you should really thank them if you're in the audience. Yeah, so thanks again for joining us, everybody. Uh, we'll see you around. Hopefully we see you again uh, on the following first Friday in December. Thanks again.